today I brought some music for you, and here it is. What do you think? Do you like it? <laughs> really? Can you hear it? <laughs> right. So, can we explain it? Right. So, apparently, there have been more words written about Beethoven's Eroica Symphony than there are actually notes in it. That means quite a lot. And as Leonard Bernstein, a famous composer and conductor, in his book, Joy of Music, wonders, has ever anyone successfully explained Eroica? And his answer to this question is no. As music, similar to love, is more easily demonstrated than explained. to talk about what music can teach us. And first of all, it teaches us that everything is connected. Every note we play influences the sound of the previous note, as well as the sound of the following one. And I like to see notes as people. Each one has its own voice, and when they are in balance, they are in harmony. And finding that right balance is success, probably, to anything. So that's the first powerful lesson music can teach us. Second of all, it teaches us how to learn, to really listen. And I love the fact that in English language, the word listen consists of the, exactly the same six letters as the word silent. And we all know how important silence is in everyday communication. Silence is always active. Can you feel it? We feel the silence when we are expecting some important results. Or we instantly know if somebody is angry at us when they are silent. In music, it's similar. Silence prepares the music, and music finishes with silence. And thinking about beginning of music and silence, timing is... I mean, this famous question pops into my mind. What was first, the chicken or the egg? So what was first, the silence or the Big Bang? And if we are talking about the beginning of music and time, timing is so important. When something is too slow, or is happening too slow, it can get boring. And if something is too fast, we cannot really enjoy it. And we say, music doesn't have time to breathe. Now, the next really fascinating thing the music teaches you is how everything starts in our mind, within our thoughts. It's really impressive how playing one phrase of melody can teach you that. Right, there should be a word mind, which says that, which says that mind is a beautiful servant, but a dangerous master. So I'm sure that every professional musician in his life had some important moments in his life when, which made them really aware why making music is special. We heard that it's not money, right? There's no money. So it has to be something else. I had few such moments in my youth, but the one that made me really think about music and playing happened when I couldn't play at all. It happened three years ago when I broke my left wrist. Not really romantic, but I was lucky, as one of the best wrist surgeons in Slovenia is, I mean, is Slovenian, and he works in a hospital in Slovenia. The operation was successful, but even after a few months, I couldn't play, I could barely move my hand, and I was thinking, well, what am I supposed to do? So I knew I needed some serious exercise. So I 
decided that I'm going to try and play a beautiful etude by Russian composer Alexander Skaryabin. Uh, this etude is something you could call pianistic gymnastics. Just the right thing when you need to stretch your hand. And whenever I play this etude, I see, I, I see this little boat in a storm in the middle of the ocean. There are strong waves, strong wind, high waves, thunder and lightning all around. The melody in the right hand implies that. But at the same time, I see huge amount of water under the surface, which seems so calm and serene, as if nothing was happening. The long chords in left hand imply that, and they are present throughout the entire piece. Now, playing these two words together, playing both hands together, creates a tremendously powerful music. Music seems to be driven forward pushing that little boat up and down and back and forth. But that little boat remains on the surface. It manages to stay in balance. While I play, imagine that you're in that boat. The piano is such a beautiful instrument. I see keys are like people, and the whole keyboard is like the whole world. You know, no wonder I have problems when I want to go on a holiday. I cannot put it into any travel bag. So that's why I have to agree with the famous interpreter of Bach's music, Glenn Gould, who said that the finest instrument of all is the mind. Everything starts in our mind. Music, everything, our every decision. So, recently I saw this picture with these words with it. And it's quite a strong statement, no? But he was Einstein, he knew what he was talking about, no? And he loved classical music. Now, when you hear classical music, you know, people often ask me this silly same question. Oh, so you play the piano, and you only play classical music. And I'm like, oh, yes. And you know what? I think the problem is in the word itself. Classical, not in the music. Because it has this ugly, equal suffix. Nobody understands what it means. That's why everybody makes this face with it. I saw some faces, I think. 
So I say we should just replace it, remove it, drop it, simplify it, just say classy music. Who doesn't like classy music? Everybody loves classy music. And Einstein was classy as well. He played the violin really good and even earned some money with it, with playing. And um, I just had this thought that maybe we should give every child an instrument to play, teach them how to love and respect music. And you know, maybe we would have a generation of young individuals self-disciplined and listening to each other. And in addition to that, playing great music together. Why? Because playing music together is one of the greatest pleasures I ever experienced. And um, there is no better thing than playing music together, even more so because you can play it with people you have never met before, and you maybe don't even speak the same language. But when you play together, you feel them, and you somehow have this impression. You just know them. And you know, we often hear this phrase, yes, music is the international language. But what does that really mean? Once I came across this philosophical story about the source of all languages, and it tells the story about the Babylon Tower and its people. Now, the story goes, all the people lived on this tower, and they all spoke the same language. In such a way, they could achieve anything. They could even build the tower so high to reach heaven. So God got angry, threw the people off the tower, and destroyed the tower. Result was, people scattered around the world, living in different countries, speaking different languages. They couldn't understand each other anymore. But what I like to say, we musicians like to say, that tower was never destroyed. We have the tower, it's the music. It's the language we all understand and we all feel in a similar way. We can all connect to it. Before, I played some Skariabin's music before, and now I would like to say a few words about this genius. Now, his musical style developed from very romantic, which I played at the beginning, which was influenced by Chopin, to a very modern, completely atonal, which nobody would like if I would play it, in only 44 years of his lifetime. But his artistic transformation, in very general sense, covers a period that spans over 250 years of musical history. In 1915, in Moscow, when he died, he was one of the most famous artists, the most influential artists that ever lived. But ironically, after his death, he was one of the most quickly forgotten ones. Why is that? How's that possible? Somebody so famous when he's alive, that's weird. But then his death, well, geniuses, obviously, they are only famous after they die, but this is completely the opposite. So he, his lifetime project, he based his new music tonal system on the knowledge which deals with self-awareness, spiritual truth, and human intuition. His life project was a piece called Mysterium, which would include millions of people, would last for seven days, would happen at the foothills of the Himalaya in India, and when it would end, it would be the end of the world. So what did he mean by that? He described it like that. There will be no public. All will be participants. This is important. The work requires special people, special artists, and completely new culture. And the cast of performance would include orchestra, large choir, piano with light project, dancers, incense, and rhythmic textural articulation, something we today probably know as electronic music. It was in 1903. So, thinking about Skyabin and his predictions about the end of the world, we can easily relate this more than 100 years old statement to the current predictions about the end of the world. Right? 21st December, we have only five days left. So what are we supposed to do? Only five days left. Where would you go? 
in your life last five days? Who would you call or visit? What would you do? I would probably play some more music. And at the end, I would like to play a piece called Dreaming by Robert Schumann. And I would like to invite you to think who these new special people and completely new culture might be. And please allow me to make a suggestion, and I mean it. Honestly, I do believe we all are those special people. There is no other people. We all influence each other in some way. We are all connected. We don't need to wait until the end of the world. We don't need to die to go to heaven. We can create something we can call heaven for ourselves. We are all paradisal players when we listen with our hearts and when we believe in beauty of our dreams. And please, always, always listen to your dreams. <laughs>